spend the rest of the morning introducing Dr. Hoff. He's so accomplished. But uh, so I've just taken some highlights of his career to let you know a little bit. But uh, Dr. Paulo Hoff received his medical degree from the University of Brazil in 1991. He then rapidly came and joined us here at the University of Miami Jackson Memorial Medical Center uh, and trained in internal medicine as part of the William Harrington Training Program for Latin America and the Caribbean. He did his fellowship in hematology and oncology at the University of Texas at MD Anderson Cancer Center where he became faculty and deputy chairman of the Department of GI Medical Oncology at MD Anderson. He there spent, stayed until 2006, uh, returning to Brazil. Uh, once re, uh, returning to Brazil, he received his PhD in the University of Sao Paulo in 2007. Dr. Hoff is a world-renowned oncologist. He has edited over 20 books and more than 200 uh, peer-reviewed manuscripts. He is a member of the Board of Directors of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, OSCO. Dr. Hoff was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in October of 2016 and formally inducted into the organization in March 14th of 2017. In 2017, he was also uh, given uh, the University of Miami International Medicine Institute Senior Fellowship Award. Presently, Dr. Hoff is the president of oncology at the Red de Or, the largest private medical care provider in Latin America. He is the professor and chairman of clinical oncology for the Department of Medicine, University of Sao Paulo. He's the vice president of the board of directors and general director of the University of Sao Paulo's Cancer Institute, which is the largest cancer hospital in the Western Hemisphere. It is a real pleasure to have Paulo here. He is uh, the true embodiment of what Dr. Harrington talked about uh, when he started his program um, to try to educate uh, future leaders in Latin America. No better leader than Dr. Hoff. Thank you, DeMarchena. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you guys here today. And uh, while Dr. DeMarchena was uh, introducing me, I remember something. I'm seeing Dr. Gelbart here, and Dr. Weiss, part of the blame of me being here is Dr. Gelbart's, because we used to have, I don't know if it's still the same, but the Department of uh, Medicine used to have a small office in Central Six, and was the only place we could get Medline at that point to, to research articles. So we were always in there. And Dr. Gelbert would come in and out. And uh, one day I was trying to decide where I would do my training in medical oncology. And uh, I had some offers, as you guys probably all have or will have when you're applying. And it was kind of undecided. And Dr. Gelbert came and said, well, don't you all Brazilians want to go to MD Anderson? If you have the chance, go. And uh, it did work well, Dr. Gelbert. So, so thankful for the thank. Thank you for the advice, although almost 30 years later, uh, it was a great advice. Uh, when Dr. DeMarchina asked me to talk about healthcare in South America, I decided to give a little twist. Of course, I had to pull this towards cancer because that's what I know. And I decided to talk about a subject that's uh, very contentious, which is universal healthcare. Uh, as you probably know, uh, universal healthcare is something very complex and something that uh, inspires uh, a lot of discussion. So since we do have an experience in Brazil with universal health care, I decide to use that uh, to open the discussions with you guys today. So first thing that we should point out is that having universal health care does not mean that you're going to pay everything to everybody. And that's a very important point. What it means is that you will have coverage to all the persons living in the determined region or country. This coverage could be covered by the government, but it could be made through mandatory purchase of health insurance or a mix of both. So this is very, very important because when we talk about South America, we talk about countries that have much lower purchasing power than the United States or Europe. So to deliver health care to everybody is really very, very challenging. I'd like to point out that universal health care is not something new. The Germans start talking about that 
in the 19th century. The idea at that point was to have a way of covering for people who were sick and couldn't afford a physician or treatment. And the concept of a national system taking care of the health care really can be uh, looked back at the United Kingdom in 1948 when they launched the NHS. Uh, we can argue if it's been successful or not, but we cannot argue that the NHS has been the model where a lot of countries have looked at to design their own health cares. The idea of uh, uh, giving the health care to all the inhabitants really started getting uh, more powerful after the Second World War, and there was a rush towards universal health care around the world after the 1990s, to the point that in 2012, the United Nations uh, had a meeting and it was agreed that all countries would try to offer universal health coverage by 2030. And I would like to point out the United States also agree with that in that particular vote. If you look at the world map today, you'll see that we do have several countries that have embraced universal health care. Uh, Brazil is one of them. And there are several others that are moving towards, as I understand, for example, Mexico, which is very close to here, is in the process of uh, walking towards universal health care coverage. Since we're going to talk about Brazil, and I don't know how much you are familiar with the country, it's the largest country in South America. It's the fifth large country in the world. We have a population of about 200 million people. And our GNP, adjusted GNP, is about $3 trillion. So it's a large economy. It's the eighth economy in the world. Our population is aging, and perhaps this is our greatest challenge right now. There is a point in every country, in the development of every country, where you have what they call the demographic bonus. You have a lot of people who are active. You don't have too many children. And you don't have too many elders. So production skyrockets. And we going through this phase right now in Brazil. But what comes after is that you have an elderly population, less younger people to pay for pension funds and for health care. So we need to make very difficult decisions right now so we can sustain the well-being of our population later on. And that's a strong discussion right now. But in the 1980s, following the tendency, the trend around the world, we start discussing in our country the universal health coverage. And there were several attempts to universalize what we had at that point uh, to give assistance to people who had no insurance. But in 1988, something very important happened to us. In 1988, in Brazil, we had a new constitution. We're coming out from a military dictatorship, so the country had to go through a new constitution. And they did something that at that point did not call too many people's attention, but today we can see as a landmark, because they inserted in the constitution of the country that health is a common right and an obligation of the state. And the implications of that probably were not uh, completely uh, uh, understood, even by the congressmen who did that. But they also put the provision that the health care should be universal and equalitarian to everybody. And this really has modeled the way our health care developed over the last 30 years. So in 1990, following the instructions of the Constitution, Congress created what we call our unified health system. Uh, this unified health system took together and it embraced all the systems that were previously available at different spheres of, uh, of state, federal, and municipalities, and tried to coordinate actions to give health care to everybody. One important thing, as I mentioned, universal health care does not mean the government's going to pay everything to everybody, and the purchase of private insurance is still allowed. And in fact, I'm going to show you that a sizable percentage of our population kind of opted out of the uh, government plan and has its own coverage. So if you look at the numbers, out of the 200 million, about 150 million depend on the government right now for medical care completely. Those people have no out-of-pocket expense and they have everything covered by the government in the places that the government uh, arranged for them to do so. But about 50 million have private insurance in Brazil, which is still a very sizable population, bigger than Spain, actually. If we look at how much we spend as a percent of our GDP, as you can see, we're in line with what most countries in Europe spend. 
We spend about 9% of our GDP in healthcare in, in Brazil. But here starts a small problem. As you can see by these bars, about half of what's spent in healthcare in Brazil comes from the private insurance and half by the government. But the government takes care of three-fourths of the population, and private only one-fourth. So you start seeing a small disequilibrium on the amount of financing that you have for each sector of the population. The second point is that although we are in line with the more developed countries in the percentage of our GDP that we invest in healthcare, we have a much smaller per capita income than other countries. So when we look at the actual amount that is spent in our patients then per year, then it's much less than the average of the developed countries, which poses a second problem because as all you know, healthcare costs are pretty much universal now. The cost of medications are not very different in the US or in Brazil or in Africa. The cost of medical devices is not much different. Yeah, there are some differences that uh, happen, but they're not as substantial as the difference that we have in the amount of money that we have at our disposal to spend. So how much are we spending now in healthcare in Brazil? close to $300 billion a year. Those figures, I had the, uh, them converted yesterday, so they're pretty recent. The government will spend about $120 billion a year, and the private insurers will pump about $170 million, uh, billion a year on health care, although the patients cover very different. And perhaps this slide's not as interesting as it should, but when the unified health system was made, there was a worry, who's gonna pay the bill? So it was divided like this. Primary care is paid by the cities. Intermediate care and, and high complexity care should be cared by the states, and the federal government should fund both. But what has happened since then is that Congress imposed minimal spending in healthcare for states and cities, but not for the federal government. So the expenditure by the federal government has remained flat percentage-wise, while the expenditure by states and cities went up a lot. So there is a huge imbalance. And why is this important? Because Brazil is a continent, and we have states that are very rich, like the state I come from, Sao Paulo, and we have states that are very poor, like the, country, the states in the Northeast. So if we're depending mostly on what the cities and states are spending, you start seeing within the country a difference in the level of healthcare that you have in the Northeast or in the South Southeast. And as you know here in Miami very well, one of the things that drives people to move around is the search for good healthcare. So we have a huge flux of patients and inhabitants from north, northeast to south, southeast, looking at better care because the hospitals are better funded just because of this that I have just shown you to you. One of the ways that we could do is that we should work on some more spending from the federal government to compensate that in the, in the north, northeast. So if you look at the world, how much each country spends in healthcare, we spend about $1.4,000 per year per, pay, per inhabitant. So it's not bad. We're light blue. So we're better than a lot of other countries. But this is an average. So if we look at this, it means that the patients that are in our private sector are doing very well. Patients who are in public sector could do better. And that's our challenge for the next few years. Another interesting thing is that when we think about government paying for health care, some people may think about government-funded clinics or hospitals. And in reality, although <clears throat> about 75% of the medical care in the country is paid by the government, it's mostly paid in private facilities. So the government does not own most of the institutions. We have 6,500 hospitals, and they're mostly private, and they're paid by the government to take care of the patients. And this poses some challenges as well, because in their... Uh, wise decision, Congress divided the payment three different ways. Primary care is paid by capitation, pretty much. Middle level care is paid as fee for service. And high complexity care is paid by package. And this is where the problem lies, because it's easy for the government not to update the prices of the packages. For example, for cancer, the last time they updated the values was 1998. So it becomes a little hard when you're 
administrating a hospital and you have to treat cancer with the same budget that you had in 1998, and yet you have all the monoclonal antibodies, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, all the new uh, advancements. So there are ways that we try to go around that, but that's one of the challenges that we have here, and one of the challenges when the government is running the decision. But it, it's unquestionable that the universal health care had a positive impact on the health of Brazilians. We had a lowering of the uh, newborn deaths, the, the, the babies that are born up to one year of age, of 70%. We had a decrease of 50% in mortality deaths around labor. And I could go on and on. And we have now a coverage over 96% for vaccination for polio, measles, etc. So the Lancet has published last year a very interesting article, and the reference is here for those who want to read, showing that the pattern of disease that we're seeing in our hospitals has changed dramatically from the time SUS was enacted to now. We got rid of uh, the epidemic diarrheas, we got rid of the epidemic infections, diseases that were controlled by vaccination, and now our patients are coming to the hospital for the same reasons they come here in the US, because of their heart or because of cancer. So we did have a positive impact despite all the difficulties that I pointed out before to you. And when we talk about cancer then, this is a major, major point of discussion on universal health care in Brazil now, and I would think in the entire South America because now we have taken care of the infectious disease problems. We have taken care of the more uh, common diseases we have before. And the number of cancer deaths, it's coming up a lot, has risen by more than 30% in this same period of time. And today is the second cause of that in Brazil. And in 10% of Brazilian cities, cancer is already the main cause of death, it has surpassed myocardial infarctions as the, the main cause of that. And we have over 600,000 cases of cancer per year now. This is how the cancer is divided. It's not much different than the epidemiology that you have here in Miami, I would think. Uh, we have had great success in reducing the smoking rate in Brazil. Less than 12% of the population smokes now. And consequently, lung cancer is going down in the least. We also had improvement in sanitation, so gastric cancer is going down. And now we face prostate, breast, and colorectal cancer as the main culprits uh, cancer-wise in Brazil. If we look at how much money we spend in the treatment of uh, cancer in Brazil, the United States will spend about $180 billion. We'll spend $10 billion in treatment cancer, government-wise, so huge difference. And the amount that's spent in uh, medications about the same. So, yeah, a lot of people complain that perhaps in the United States we're spending a more money than we should, but the reality, I think we are underfunded. I think that we should be spending more uh, on cancer care. That's our fight over there. We used this slide the other way that you guys probably would use. We used to try to convince lawmakers to give us more money. And uh, so now there's uh, didn't move uh, too much. Uh, this is this is what we are going to be spending, but uh, for some reasons not. Oh, here you go. So. I'm going to divide now my talk a little bit on the public and then private sector because they are very different for you to understand how we do. This is the cancer center I direct in Sao Paulo. It was built in 2008 and was designed to be the largest cancer center in the country. We have 500 beds and we take care now of about 50,000 patients. So when we think about strategic planning in the public sector, one thing that we saw that was very necessary was improvement in access. The second thing was to be the development of cancer centers because the care was, was fragmented before. You had surgery in one place, radiation in another, chemotherapy in another. We need to increase the number of people trained in the country. That's a major problem. Improve the infrastructure and revamp the research rules and find new funding sources, and that's what I'm going to show to you. So the first step in 2009 was to reaffirmed that every citizen is covered for cancer care and that we should have a cancer center for every 500,000 inhabitants spread to our, to, throughout the country. All modalities should be covered. Oral medications are included because that was a major contentious point. 
And at that point, there was the suggestion that we should have a more streamlined process for approval of new drugs. So we have now in the health ministry an office called Conitech that's the one that decides what the SUS is going to pay. Looking at these timelines, we also realized that in Brazil, because the care was so fragmented, you would have patients diagnosed that would spend months without treatment, trying to get into a treatment center. So we were able to manage to get in 2012 a law that says that every patient with a diagnosis has to be treated in 60 days, it has to receive treatment within 60 days. So 60 days might sound a lot, but our average, Dr. Weiss, was around four months. So it, and we have been able to do this. Right now, it's working and uh, has changed to me dramatically the outcome for a lot of patients. We also have been able to, to work on the concept of the Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, you guys do have one here, so I don't need to explain to you the importance of having a comprehensive cancer center that takes care of all the patient's needs. And we do want to use them also to develop guidelines to be using community on satellite offices and to be able to integrate research, care, and education. And we're able to get the health ministry to uh, disallow the opening of any single modality institution in the future. So from now on, if you want to treat cancer and you want to be certified by the health ministry and be paid for by the government, you have to give the entire package. You need to have surgery, you need to have medical oncology and radiation therapy, or be a satellite facility from a center that offers all the three modalities. Because before, for example, say you have a patient with rectal cancer, you had to go to one place to get your chemotherapy, another one to get your radiation, and yet a third one to get your surgery. Imagine the logistics to getting all these people working together if they are not in the same institution. So this has been, to me, a major advance. And we have now 329 cancer centers, or very small, I wouldn't call them comprehensive cancer centers, but centers that provide all the care in the country. We need 400. So we still need to go up, but we have opened a significant amount over the last few years. And just to give you an idea, in 2008, as I said, we opened the, the Cancer Institute in Sao Paulo, and I'm going to show you what we did since then. So we see 10,000 new cases per year of patients. We have 50,000 patients currently on treatment, and you have all the numbers uh, here. But what's really important to me is that we have been able to reduce dramatically the lines of patients waiting for treatment in the major city in Brazil. Uh, it was unacceptable that the richest city had lines of people to be treated, and with this, we're able to do that. We also set up the largest radiation uh, therapy uh, center. We have 10 linear accelerators. And right now, your waiting time for radiation therapy in ESASP is two days to be seen by the radiation therapist and, and start treatment. And so, really, uh, we think that we did a significant impact. Now, when we start ESASP in 2008, we realized very quickly that one of the main problems was we had was on the decision to incorporate new medications. I mean, if you look at this plot, if you have something that doesn't work, you don't incorporate. That's easy. If you have something that works and is cheap, it's also easy. The problem you have is in the yellow mark there, because if you have something that works but it's very expensive, then how do you decide where you're going to allocate your restricted funds? And we start a process where we start discussing with a group of people of all the areas to make these decisions, and the governor liked, so he took the 74 centers in the state of Sao Paulo, and ask us to coordinate a network. We form a network it's called Rei de Abbe Camargo. So what this is, is a forum between all 74 institutions that in the state receive state money to treat uh, patients. We meet once a month, we validate guidelines, and we make an interface with the health secretary of the state in all matters of incorporation of new technologies within the state itself. So we're trying to help to plan the growth of cancer care within the state of Sao Paulo. And this has worked very, very, very well. Um, we also created something that's called CROSS. So if today you have cancer in Sao Paulo and you need care, you just need to dial one number and you'll get into the first available treatment center closer to you. 
not necessarily the one you want to go, but you're going to be seeing very fast. So it has, has worked pretty nicely. And we also have been training new facilities. So we had a new facility in a coastal area in Santos, for those who know Sao Paulo. And we took the pharmacists, the oncologists, the nurses to Sao Paulo, and they spent time with us training. And then we returned them with our own protocols of treatment for them to implement in that area that has about a million people to be treated. Now, one of the things that we haven't been able to do as much as I want was to improve funding state-wise, but we, we continue working on that. And the idea of these networks to work on prevention, decrease the number of cases, early diagnosis, early detection, and do the treatment closer to the patient's home. We, we find it unacceptable for someone to travel 600 kilometers, so three, 400 miles to get radiation and come back. So we want the treatment to be spread throughout the state so every patient can be treated. Now, regarding training, and I have to show this, Dr. Galbard, I know you like uh, education. We have increased the number of fellowship positions in the country. Now, we had about 100 positions. We close to 200. In the state, in the university where I worked, when I came in, we had three positions. Now we have 14 positions per year. In our program, we are very proud that we have developed a core curriculum that's being implemented in several other institutions. And our fellows take the American Society of Clinical Oncology in-service exam every year. And uh, to your left here, you have the actual printout of the result of this year. And our fellows were fourth in the world among 200 programs that were tested. So I think we, we have been able to really increase the bar on the training of medical oncologists in our, in our institution. The government also has making some dialogue with the society and was identified that we had a dire lack of radiation therapy in the public service. That's why I mentioned that we do it very fast. And actually, Brazil has bought 140 linear accelerators from Varian. It was, was a public call, and they're going to build, they are building a, a factory in Brazil to make those linear accelerators and spread around the country. Now, we don't have enough radiation oncologists, we don't have enough physicists, so we're working on training them, and of course those equipments will be installed over many years, but I think that this is going to really reduce dramatically the need for radiation therapy within the uh, public system, and uh, I think that uh, we'll make care closer to home much easier than it was before. Now, we have many, many challenges. If we were to show this to a medical oncologist in Brazil, he's going to point Conitec. Conitec is called our NICE, the same concept as NICE. So physicians, society, industry meet and decide what's going to be incorporated in the, by the government. And usually the answer is no. It doesn't matter what was the question. But uh, we try to work hard with them to make them understand that you know, oncology is changing, we're curing more patients, we need to have availability of uh, new technologies for our patients, which are cost effective and then, then really can change what happens in the life of these patients. Also, we need to improve our research environment. We have a large number of patients, one of the largest number of patient, uh, largest patient, uh, cancer patient population in the world. We should be doing more research than what we're doing now. Last year at uh, ISASP, we entered 1,200 patients in clinical trials, but we could do much better, and countrywide, we're working on that. So we've been working on a lot of uh, political steps. We, we have helped to pass the mandatory coverage for all medications, the mandatory treatment within 60 days. We also got the government to approve a measure where you can direct 1% of your income tax to a, pro, uh, a project that has been approved by the health ministry related to cancer. So this is not a tax, tax deduction. You actually just take, like you do for, I think in the United States, you can check for political campaign, 1%. There you can give 1% for cancer research. And we have been able to do a lot with this money. Uh, last year, I think, was something like $100, $150 million, but there's space to improve more. And we have a new research law that has crossed the lower chamber, now it's uh, has crossed the Senate, now it's in the lower chamber, but I've talked to the health minister recently and I think it's going to go through and it's making the environment for research much more friendly than it was before. So we think that that could be a significant boost for the treatment of our patients. So this is for the 
the public part, this is a picture of the University of Sao Paulo Medical Center. The tall building is the cancer center, and you have the Heart Institute and, and the other 11 institutes that make up the, the University of Sao Paulo. And then I'm going to talk to you just five minutes about the private setting. Um, this picture is, uh, is uh, of a hospital that we're building. We're going to open now in May, and uh, it's going to be like the crown jewel of, uh, of my career, I think. So if we look at the number of Brazilians that have private insurance, it was going steadily up. I told you that we have about 50 million people insured. Uh, it stopped going up in 2014 when we had a financial crisis, but there's no reason to think that once the crisis abate, and it's abating now that this number is not going to continue going up. If you look at uh, polls, you would think that Brazilians would think that uh, security was more important, but in reality, the first topic of concern is healthcare. So we really think there's substantial space for progress. We do have a very substantial private health industry in Brazil, which we're very proud of. I have some numbers for you here, but the numbers are astonishing. As I said, although it's only 50 million people, this is already bigger than Spain. And it's the same size as South Korea, the entire size of South, population of South Korea. And uh, so with this, we think that we have the substrate to really have a premier type of uh, healthcare. We have an excellent infrastructure, we have uh, excellent physicians and nurses. We do have problems that the cover is still variable from place to place. Uh, a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot of the medications are still imported. Uh, but the reality is that uh, we do think that we have a decent private health care system. One of the main challenges we have is judicialization, as we call it in Brazil. Patients tend to go to the court to demand things that they see fit, even if it's not yet proven. So, but that's something that I think many countries have to deal with. There's a rapid consolidation in the, in the cancer care. Right now, four companies probably take care of about 30% of the market. One of the companies is the one that I have joined, the Redidor. And uh, we do have um, some insurers that are looking to verticalization. So some insurers don't want to I, I guess here the HMOs do something like that. They will have their own services. So that's uh, a threat. The Redidor that I mentioned is the largest hospital group in Brazil. We have right now 43 hospitals. We're building three more. And uh, we have some very large numbers, as can point out to you. And they have an oncology arm that they asked me to lead and make it grow. We are present in nine states of Brazil right now. I have 300 medical oncologists and radiation oncologists, uh, almost 1,000 employees, and we see about 21,000 new patients per month. Um, we do have a not-for-profit research and education uh, group. We conduct clinical trials. Uh, we do have residencies in different uh, areas, including medical oncology. And we think that uh, we do some significant research. If you recall Zika, the Zika virus, uh, I don't know if you, any of you have an interest in that, but if you look at the nature that had the, the cover with the mini brains that were artificially made to study the virus, they were made by us. We have an agreement with the University of Rio de Janeiro, and those mini brains were made by our guys in uh, Rio in our research facility over there. So a strong interest in neurology as well. And we're building a medical school in Rio. Uh, we bought a hospital that was built in the 18th century. We're refurbishing the hospital to become the medical school, and we're building a teaching hospital with 400 beds in, in the back. So we think that we should have, in a couple of years, a very interesting medical school there as well. And we do have a vision that's very close to what I present to you in the public side. I want our patients, private patients, to have care close to their homes. That's why we're spreading to so many states. We want to have the clinics supported by high complexity centers. I think that the U.S. is following this model. You have the satellite and you do it in central, the, the more uh, complex type of cases. We use multi-professional teams and we do look into treatment individualization. And in Brazil, we call it humanization of care. We want the patient to feel at home and feel cared for. So 
we do also think that real-time information, big data, is the future of cancer care, and we're working to integrate all this into one huge data bank. So what can I tell about cancer care in Brazil? I think private patients have treatment available that's very similar to what you would get here. It's very complex, it's sophisticated, although we do have problems like everywhere else in the world. Public is very, very generous, but grossly underfunded, so we need to work on this. We need to make sure that wherever you are in Brazil that you get your treatment within an hour, hour and a half from your home. And I do think that for us, the combination of public and private has worked well. It might not be the solution for every single country, but somebody told me that it would not be civilized to have excellent health care for those who can afford and let those who cannot afford not have any type of coverage. So each country will make their own decision, but we, we have decided that we would try to work to avoid that. Now, I do have, out of those 300 physicians, I have a group that works with me. This is my clinic in Sao Paulo. This are the group that works with me. Some of them have been in the Latin American training program here. Joan's sister is, uh, is sitting right there. Uh, my wife was in the, is seated to the right here, is the one seated more to the right, trained with us here as well in the University of Miami. And we very, very fond, Dr. Wise, of the, the opportunities that the University of Miami gave to us to improve the healthcare in Brazil and South America. I'm sure all the colleagues from other countries think the same. Um, I'm not sure I'm the embodiment of Dr. Harrington's vision, as you said, Dr. De Marchena, but we certainly like the idea that uh, by coming here, we're able to bring back more than just the knowledge, the individual knowledge, but I think what was most important that we learned from Dr. Harrington is that whatever you do, you need to try to make this count to other people as well. So. Certainly, we, we want personal growth out of this, but we want to give back to the community. And the sense of the treatment, the multidisciplinary treatment, is something that was very, very strong here at the University of Miami. And I, I remember with uh, great fondness uh, our clinics. I was just remember Dr. Gelbart used to be my attending at the VA, and we had wonderful clinics over there. Uh, so. I, all I can say to all of you is that I think you are in a great place, and to say to the faculty and administrators of uh, the University of Miami that we find the Latin American training program, Dr. Harrington's program, to be one of the best things in the U.S., and uh, something that really has made a change in the lives of uh, many people in South and Central America. Thank you. Dr. Huff, you're an inspiration to all of us, and we're grateful that Dr. DiMarcetto invited you today, and uh, many of the people on this side of the room are currently in the Harrington program, and I'm sure are uh, basking in your glory and happy so much for what you uh, succeeded. I think we have time for a few questions, and I'd like to begin by asking you one of the <laughs> main issues that we have uh, he, even here at the University of Miami, where we have a county hospital and we have a private hospital, um, and we try and deliver equitable care, and you have a perfect opportunity in Brazil to compare the private and the public uh, insured uh, patients, and is there any evidence in terms of outcomes that are different in the two uh, spheres of, of care that you give for cancer patients? Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Uh, I, I was making sure Dr. Lopez would not stroke out when I was presenting because, of course, when you present, you, you, you give the nice touches. You don't talk too much about your problems. And uh, it's two things are very interesting in your question. The first, that first time I had the chance to live into a system that didn't care much about what kind of coverage a patient had was here. In 1990, when I came, treatment here is much more equitable than we had anywhere else in Brazil. So, and we, we never asked the patient that was being admitted to Jackson, do you have insurance or, you know, I'm not going to give you this treatment because I'm not allowed. We gave what the patients needed to, so it was good. But answering your question more objectively, yes, there is a difference. And uh, unfortunately, the underfunding is reflected in cancer because of the expen expensive drugs. 
So I think Dr. Gilberto Lopez has participated in a paper that was published showing that breast cancer patients did better in the private sector, especially because of lack of access to some other medications, not because of difference in the medical care. So it was just the access that was different, and Gilberto, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Dr. Rosenblatt. Uh, Dr. Rosen. How do you deal with that? That's, a, that's become a staple. Yeah, it's, it's, that's the major point, the contentious point we have now. If you're in the private sector, they're paying for. They're paid for. As long as they're included in the role of medication, they're covered by private insurance, which is released every two years, then they are covered. Insurance companies are using this two years kind of a buffer to pre prepare, I think, until the medications come, but eventually they will cover. In the public sector, Conitech, which is like NICE, has been very reluctant to uh, incorporate, for example, Brutinib is not incorporated in the, in the public sector still. Now, this has created a huge problem with the courts because if the patient is knowledgeable, reads Google, and wants to have a Brutinib for his lymphoma, he will sue and the courts will give him and the government will have to pay. So as of... Uh, 2018, the government spent about $2 billion last year paying for drugs that were ordered to be given by the courts. So we don't have a solution yet. What did I propose, and it's being discussed, and certainly others will propose different things. I think that for those kind of expensive drugs in the public sector, the government has to buy them. We can't. Uh, we, we, we need to, to have a sizable purchase that will allow us to negotiate deep discounts. We cannot pay this kind of money. Uh, I don't think the U.S. can pay this kind of money for everybody, and we certainly can't. Now, we have done, Dr. Wise, with some companies that have similar products. We have done put one in one room, the other one in the other room, and say, well, I'm going to buy one. You guys decide how much you're going to discount me to buy yours, and I'm going to give you a one-year contract. Right. And that sometimes works. But I understand here in the U.S. <laughs> it's more difficult. But to pay for CAR T cell, it has to be a hell of a health insurance and life insurance. Uh, I, I don't know. But that's the point that we have not solved, Dr. Rosenblatt. And it, it's, it's very difficult when you see a patient, in the, in, especially in the public sector, and you know this patient would get better by getting a Britney, let's say, and, and you don't have that. that that's perhaps that the greatest drawback of the system right now. But the problem is lack of funding. It's not the system itself. It's the lack the underfunding of the, the whole process. Now, I remind you, and, and this is kind of in, insane. I mean, we do get discounts, but the official price is very close to the U.S. because the companies don't want to lower the cost outside of the U.S. because they know this will pressure the price here. And the U.S. is 50% of the market. Brazil is 4% of the market. So they will not make huge... Uh, discounts up front because they will fear to damage their main market. So it's, it's a difficult equation. So what can the oncology community do internationally to lower the prices, if anything, of these very expensive drugs? I mean, our, our, the President <laughs> of the United States talks about this as one of his main uh, goals, but uh, leaving politics aside, how does one approach that? I think the solution will have to come from the United States. If the United States start reducing the cost one way, either by negotiating, which Medicare is not doing that, that now, or some other reason, the prices worldwide will go down. But a country that has 4% of the, of the market share has very little power to influence the, the, the cost overall. Yes, I mean, if you look at the numbers, and 
I may be wrong on my math, but I think I'm pretty close. The, the American government spent to about 25 to 30 percent of the cancer drugs worldwide. It's a huge buyer. I mean, until this buyer decides to step in and negotiate prices, we're not going to. The other ones will not have enough power to negotiate down. Okay, we we have national coverage for screening for breast and uh, and uh, cervical cancer. Problems we have in the north part of Brazil. Sometimes you have to go by boat in a river to be able to screen for cervical cancer, and there's still a lot of taboo. Like the husband will not let the wife be examined by another guy. So we still have problems, regional problems, and. Uh, Cervical cancer now it's, remains a problem in the north, northeast, is not a problem in south, southeast anymore. Breast cancer coverage is throughout and is getting better. Colorectal cancer, which is the third tumor, has a decent screening on the fecal coat blood test, and we propose to the health ministry. Uh, there is a senator, and Dr. Lopez knows her well, Ana Amelia, that helped us to get the health ministry in, in a hearing in the Senate to discuss introducing the screening for colorectal cancer, which is something that I do. My line of research is colorectal cancer. And the problem we faced was almost Byzantine, because the health ministry said that they could not have a policy different in a different region of the country. So if they enacted a policy to do screening in the south-southeast, they would have to do north-northeast as well. And there, the problem is not as much colorectal cancer. So they, hence, they wouldn't do anywhere. So what we're trying to do is to convince the state governments to do uh, the screening for colorectal cancer. It's our current fight, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's a substantial problem, and the incidence is going up, particularly in women. Well, about, yes, about this. I was interested in the law that provides the 60-day ceiling on when to provide care. How is that implemented and enforced? Well, it's implemented uh, through, in Sao Paulo, I, can tell, I cannot tell you in the other states, in Sao Paulo we have CROSS, which is a centralized agency that makes the distribution of patients. The way it's enforced is kind of draconian. If uh, uh, an institution that receives money from, uh, from SUS fails to comply with the 60-day rule, uh, you can lose up to 15% of your budget. Now, there's... there's there's one unintended consequence of that, since we're, we're being, we are among friends. So the unintended consequence is that institutions are very, very reluctant to accept lines. So if I reach the number of patients I promise to see, we all have goals. So if I promise to see 100 breast cancer patients, in the past, when the 101st came, I squeezed in the line and said, well, wait, I'll, I'll get you through. Now, when you reach 100, which is your promise, say, okay, I reached my quota, and I'm not going to accept more in the line because I risk crossing the 60 days and lose uh, uh, resource. So that's the unintended consequence. But as a rule in Sao Paulo, we, and again, I can only talk about Sao Paulo, but we have uh, an institution called FOSP that follows the epidemiology, and we are being able to comply with the 60 days in general. Dr. Huff, thank you so very much thank for you, honoring us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here.